I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We are a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit. It's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week, here on Conservation Connection, we do just that. Introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management, and we ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with EarthX here in Dallas, Texas. EarthX is the largest Earth Day celebration in the world, and it brings in speakers from every corner of the environmental arena. Listen in to hear the stories of today's environmental titans, covering everything from environmental law, ocean health, renewable energy, clean transportation, and so much more. Let's get to the show. Alrighty, guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We're here in Dallas, Texas for EarthX 2022, and we are incredibly excited for this episode. We're sitting down with Paul Watson, who is the founder of Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm very excited for this episode because you have been in this field for quite a while working to protect our planet in a lot of different ways. Uh, and there's been a lot of different takes on what you do. Uh, so just to start off, can you give us just a quick snippet of what Sea Shepherd Conservation Society is and what their goals are? In 1972, I was the co-founder of the uh, Greenpeace Foundation, but I left Greenpeace in 77 to establish Sea Shepherd because Greenpeace is a protest organization. I wanted to intervene, so I developed a strategy called uh, aggressive nonviolence. So we're going to intervene, but we're not going to hurt anybody. And, you know, 45 years later, we never caused an injury to anybody. We've never been convicted of a felony crime or anything, but we have shut down uh, literally thousands of illegal operations around the world. So do you have a proudest moment that you've had during, you said in the 70s is when you started? 77 is when I established Sea Shepherd, 45 years ago. Okay. So in all of that time, do you have like, wow, this is really my proudest moment? Well, I think uh, the thing I'd be most proud of is the fact that Sea Shepherd has evolved into an international movement in 42 different countries. We have 12 ships. Right now we have about 250 volunteers from 25 different nations on those ships. That is, you know, kind of the dream of any any nonprofit organization, right, is to grow and, and really accomplish their mission internationally. So that's, I mean, kudos to you. It's, it's sure been a very long road and, and very difficult for you, but a lot of successes along the way. Well, it's also important to uh, grow without being encumbered by bureaucracy. So, <laughs> Which is a very interesting, That's a, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about kind of the name of the game in nonprofits a lot of the time is bureaucracy. You're really encumbered in your reporting requirements and, and how you can do things. But uh, you seem to have been able to avoid a lot of that. So what is kind of your formula for avoiding that bureaucracy? Well, it's decentralization. Uh, sea Shepherds in 42 different countries, they're all separate entities. They're board of directors and they're, they're operated by the people in those countries, Brazil, Australia, France, Germany, whatever. Uh, and then th they're all independent, but they all contribute towards the operation of the ships, which is uh, overseen by uh, Sea Shepherd Global, which is based in, uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, we also do not invest money into fundraising. We don't do direct mail campaigns and things like that. We feel, uh, I mean, it's grown by word of mouth. We feel that if people are really concerned about protecting our ocean, they'll come to us. We're not going to spend money to go to them. That's a really effective way to bring in the people that you're trying to bring in, right? Because a lot of the times when you do these broadcast campaigns, you're going to be catching some people that are really interested in your and what you're going to do, and they're going to stick around for a long time. But most of the people that you reach are not interested. So it's kind of a waste of resources. Yeah, we, we have a very loyal uh, support base around the world. And they're loyal because, like I said, they come to us. We don't go to them. Yeah, and I'm sure they're loyal because they can see, like, you are making a change. You are doing the things that you set out to do. What is kind of the day-to-day -day life for you as founder of this organization? I mean, when I think about it, I'm like, gosh, you're probably just, you're either on a boat, like doing the work, or you're just like sitting at your computer and making phone calls, like organizing, organizing, organizing all of these boats. I think I'm just good at delegation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have, uh, those ships have their captains, their officers, their crew. Uh, the various uh, countries have their directors, their, their, you know, their leaders and that. And uh, I, 
to be honest, I have no idea what Sea Shepherd is doing half the time and around the world because they're all there's probably a hundred projects going and they're all led by those people who have it well in hand. I don't need to intervene, you know. Like for instance, I remember I get a call from a reporter saying a Sea Shepherd Nicaragua has just rescued these turtles. I'm going. I didn't even know we had a Sea Shepherd Nicaragua. <laughs> <laughs> what a blessing to have an organization that has grown to the point that it's just doing good, and you don't you literally can't know every operation because it's grown to such a large size. Right. And it takes, a, you know, no, no one person can actually handle these things. So, you know, for instance, we have a campaign uh, on the Amazon right now to protect the river dolphin that was organized by three women in Brazil. And uh, we're working in partnership with uh, the indigenous nations in the Amazon and everything. And, you know, I don't have the time to, to put that together myself. So, you know, and they just keep me informed about what they're doing. They're doing a good job. So from what I have learned about Sea Shepherd is that originally you started with just the goal of basically protecting whales and seals. That was kind of the original mission, correct? No, uh, our objective was to protect marine wildlife, okay. to protect both diversity and interdependence of life in the, in the sea. Uh, now, the focus usually from the media point of view is on whales and seals, but uh, we're involved with everything from phytoplankton to, uh, you know, sea cucumbers to uh, lobsters, you name it, and we're involved in all of that. But um, the media tends to focus on the more sexy issues like whales and baby seals. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, it's kind of neat to have an organization that does work with those big charismatic megafauna, right? The things that look cute, on a poster or in a video, but is also able to do good for the real support system for those charismatic megafauna, like the phytoplankton and like the, the smaller trophic levels that are supporting those, those big animals up top. Well, my biggest concern is for phytoplankton. Uh, since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. Phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe, sequesters enormous amounts of CO2. And the reality is this, if phytoplankton disappears from the sea, we all die. We don't live on this planet without it. And uh, so the, the real problem is that most people are unaware that of its even its, of its existence. And that's been a real challenge trying to get that, that point across. You know, I, I appeal to children a lot doing children's books and things like this. And because uh, uh, sometimes I don't know if adults can actually learn anything. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but one of the things I do to try and get that across is to have People imagine the world as a spaceship, which is what it is. We're on this incredibly trip, a trip around the Milky Way galaxy. But every spaceship has a life support system, which provides us with the air we breathe and regulates climate and temperature and the food we eat. And that life support system is uh, run, maintained by uh, engineers, all of those species that make it possible. We humans, we're, we're passengers. We're having a wonderful time entertaining ourselves. But what we are doing is we're killing engineers were murdering engineers and there's only so many of them they can remove before the machinery begins to fall apart and so uh, that's i like to get people to understand it in that way to show just right. how important the bees the trees uh, the phytoplankton the fish are um in fact i mean a few years ago i got a call from the fox network i think it was brett humes was the, was the reporter he said you know i heard that you said that uh, bees trees fish and uh, and uh, whales were and worms actually were more important than people I said, yeah, I, I said that. And he said, well, how could you say something so outrageous? I said, well, I said it because they're more important than people. Because, he, you know, <laughs> they can live without us. We, we can't live without them. We need them. They don't need us. That makes them ecologically far more important than we are. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that's, we're obviously such a human-centric race, right? We care about people over all of the things. And that's just kind of our, our natural tendency. And it really takes a concerted effort to open people's eyes to the fact that we are a very tiny cog and a very big machine. And we're currently throwing wrenches in everything that we can just by our, our existence. Well, it isn't actually a natural tendency. Indigenous people around the world understand that we they view the world through a biocentric uh, perspective, that we're part of everything. We're interconnected with everything. Uh, unfortunately, Unfortunately, a lot of the world now is anthropocentric and with this delusion that it's all created for us, it's all about us, we're the center of the universe, and nothing else matters. I mean, what, the, the universe has been around 14 billion years, the Earth's been around 4 billion years, and a bunch of monkeys on a rock somewhere decided it's all about us. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you said that I just want to kind of bring up as a point is that phytoplankton are, are currently 
the largest contributor to the oxygen that we breathe and sequestering the carbon that we're producing. And I don't think people realize that our current atmospheric makeup of largely nitrogen with, you know, about about 19 to 20% oxygen. 21%, yeah. Yeah, plus, you know, a, a percentage of CO2. That's a relatively new phenomenon. Speaking across the life of the Earth, there was a time when there was no oxygen at all, right? And, and oxygen was actually created as uh, by uh, living things, which actually polluted their own planet. Right, and, and caused actually, a huge die-off. Yeah, an anaerobic bacteria, which forced them, to, forced them into the swamps, the muck, and into our guts. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, it was, if you want to learn more about that, look up the Great Oxygenation Event. I think there's an awesome Wikipedia page about it. But it just goes to show that our current atmosphere is not eternal. It can be changed. And in fact, it is being changed every day that we're here. It's all being affected by chemicals, and uh, we're putting a lot of chemicals into that system, which is going to have an impact. Yeah, absolutely. To kind of bring back up what we were talking about previously and how Sea Shepherd is run and the history of it, I have two questions that may go a little bit hand in hand. One is, what gives you hope, basically? Why do you continue to do this? And the other is, where do you think the world, this industry of whaling and overfishing and everything would be if there was no Sea Shepherd? Well, I know that if it wasn't for our presence in the Sea of Cortez, the vaquita would now be extinct. And uh, our, what we did down in the Southern Ocean is we, we drove the Japanese whaling fleet out of the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, and it is actually now a sanctuary. And humpback whale populations are recovering as a result, and the Australian government even acknowledged that uh, just recently. So I think we are making, having an impact in, in that way. And uh, so we're also working, we've developed since 2014, we developed uh, a new uh, strategy, which is working in partnership with uh, various governments around the world. We provide the resources, they provide uh, the authority, the enforcement. So we're now in partnership with about a dozen or so African nations and with uh, Latin American nations. And uh, these are signed agreements where, for instance, just Four days ago, we arrested a Chinese trawler in the waters of Liberia. We've seized 78 uh, poaching vessels in African waters over the last year. We're doing anti-poaching work in the Mediterranean in cooperation with the Italian government. Uh, so we try to cooperate where we can. Uh, inside territorial waters, they have the authority, so we have to work with that. Outside of uh, international jurisdictions, uh, there is no authority. It's the Wild West. Uh, the only thing we have is the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which allows for governments, individuals, and non-government organizations to uphold international conservation law. So that's our authority there. When people ask us, well, how do you get away with doing what you're doing? It's for the same reason they get away with what they're doing. Uh, you know, what they're doing is illegal. But if you don't enforce them, <laughs> you right. know, What's the point of having laws if there's no enforcement? I'm really having the opportunity to sit down here and interact with you directly. Uh, I'm really impressed by your just even-tempered nature, which I think a lot of people would be surprised by based off of the controversial nature and the, the discussion about kind of your tactics and the ways in which you're stopping whaling. What are your thoughts on how controversial your work has become? Like, Do you think that it's just a completely ridiculous way to respond to what you're doing because you're just upholding... The agreements that have already been made? I've never really been concerned about what anybody thinks. Uh, you know, my clients are the creatures that live in the ocean. Uh, I don't do this for people. I do it for them. So people can criticize us. It doesn't really matter to me. And on your question about hope, I don't really focus on that. I Back in 1973, I volunteered to be a medic for the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. We were surrounded by 3,000 federal officers shooting at us. They killed two, wounded 46. I went to Russell Means, who is the leader for the American Indian Movement. And I said, we don't have any hope of winning this. Uh, the odds against us are overwhelming. So what are we doing here? And what he told me has stayed with me for the rest of my life. He said, well, we're not concerned about the odds against us. We're not concerned about winning or losing. We're here because it's the right thing to do, the right place to be, and the right time to do it. Don't worry about the future. Focus on the present. What you do in the present will define what the future will be. And that's where your power lies, in the present. And so I don't get pessimistic. I don't get uh, you know depressed or anything like that. I, I feel that... Um, 
we just have to be activists and do everything we can. And the strength of an ecosystem is in diversity. Therefore, the strength of any movement has to be in diversity. So whether it's direct action, litigation, legislation, education, it all works towards the same end. So that diversity within the movement is what's going to make a real difference and what is making a real difference. I really like that because one of the changes I've seen in the green movement in my time working within it is we're moving away from this us versus them, really aggressive us versus them divisive mentality into more of a every boot on the ground in this fight is important, whether it's it's a specialty in direct action or a specialty in whatever your skills are, whatever skills you have, bring them to the fight because we need everybody. And I, I really like to see that inclusiveness because that's how things get done. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't believe in fighting with uh, other organizations. We get attacked, but usually just ignore it. Um, one of the funny things that happened way back in 86 when we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet, destroyed the whale processing plant. And I was doing a talk show in Vancouver, Canada, and somebody called in a bomb threat to protest me being violent, which I thought was somewhat strange. But we had to yeah. evacuate the building. And a reporter says, Greenpeace has just called you an eco-terrorist. What's your response? I didn't want to get into a fight with Greenpeace. So I just, oh, what do you expect from the Avon ladies of the environmental movement anyway? They've never forgiven me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopping back to something you said just a few sentences ago about working with the government. In a lot of these places, you're going, you do a lot of work with these governments, but you also have some governments that seem to be working against you some. So you've had some red notices put out for you. You, I think, have one out now. What, well, I guess, first of all, for people listening who may not know, what is a red notice? What does that mean? And how does it make you feel? Are you just like, this is ridiculous? Well, the red notice is an Interpol alert that uh, when you go into a country, it will trigger an alert. And then it's up to the country whether to detain you and then extradite you to the country that uh, issued the red notice. The red notices are usually for war criminals, major uh, drug traffickers, serial killers. Uh, I'm the only person in the history of Interpol to be put on there for conspiracy to trespass on a whaling boat. <laughs> Interesting. Didn't, didn't hurt anybody, didn't damage any property, but we did cost Japan a lot of uh, in prestige because we, we stopped their operations in the Southern Ocean. They're illegal operations in the Southern Oceans, but Japan's a powerful country. So that's where they were able to do that. Uh, they actually convinced Costa Rica to put a a red notice out on me, and that was there until 2018 when they had a change of government. And the new government, the environment minister, called me up and apologized, and they dismissed it, which shows you how political right. it is. Yes. So, um, you know, this is just par for the course. You have to deal with these things. We've been, I've been arrested numerous times, never been convicted in on any of these occasions. Um, but uh, we, we feel that going into court is an extension of what we do in, in the field. You know, back in '93, I. Uh, I drove the Cuban and Spanish drag trawlers off of the nose and the tail of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, and Canada arrested me and charged me three counts of mischief, so I was on trial uh, facing two times life plus 10 on mischief charge. Didn't hurt anybody, didn't damage any property, but again, it was very political. Canada spent like $5 million trying to get me in prison on this. Oh, wow. my gosh. And my lawyer opened up the case. Uh, it was a jury trial. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, uh, we're not going to say that we didn't do what we're charged with. We're going to say that we did exactly what we're charged with. We're proud to have done it. And we intend to do it again. And we won the case. Our defense was the UN World Charter for Nature. And Canada brought in a law professor to say, oh, it had no uh, validity in Canadian law. And the judge said, well, didn't Canada sign this? And she says, oh, yeah, well, Canada signs a lot of things. <laughs> so uh, the judge told the jury they had to take it into account. Wow. That's, it's insane to me at this juncture where we have so much science backing the amount of damage that we're producing that governments would be saying, oh no, we need to, we need to shut him up. We need to lock him away so that, that he can no longer do what he's doing because it's disruptive. I mean, it makes sense because there's a lot of money in the efforts that you're trying to stop. But There's a great number of people in the world who are really just stupid. <laughs> and and that means that science, uh, they have no respect for science. And, uh, you know, and we've seen that over in many, so many different ways. Uh, and a lot of those really stupid people, unfortunately, tend to be drawn towards government as their, as their career. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of moving back to just what Sea Shepherd does and like, you know, the much needed cause, but also, you know, the quote unquote fun stuff that people are probably listening for. What current projects do you have going on right now? 
Well, we have one ship in the Amazon now protecting the uh, river dolphins there. We have two ships in the Mediterranean doing anti-poaching work. We have one vessel off of uh, West Africa doing anti-poaching work. Uh, we have another vessel in the Bay of Biscay protecting dolphins from the French uh, trawling fleet up there. Uh, we have uh, another vessel that just left Brazil, and it's going to somewhere I can't really say because until it gets there, we can't really say what it's doing. Smart. Uh, then we have uh, Martin Sheen, our only sailing boat, is doing research off of Mexico. And we have three ships in the Sea of Cortez that are working to protect the uh, the Vaquita Porpoise. Uh, and that's going really well. We work in a very in cooperation with the Mexican Navy. So, uh, well, we were seizing uh, gill nets. We seized about 150,000 of them. And the, the fishermen got all upset and everything. And so the Mexican government backed off on that and told us we couldn't. Uh, seized gill nets, but then it, they, what they made us an offer. So what we do is we sit in the Bakita Refuge, and if any poachers come in, we call the Navy. Within 10 minutes, they're there and disperse them. Awesome. And I, I think an interesting note to make about the issue with the Vaquita, if our listeners don't know, the Vaquita is a, a small porpoise that lives in the Sea of Cortez. Yes, it's it's the smallest, most endangered marine mammal in the, on the planet, uh, porpoise. And it's not being fished directly. It's it, they're not putting nets in the water to catch the vaquita. They're they're trying to catch the totuaba, right? Which is a, a large. It's a bycatch of the totuaba fishery. Totuaba swim bladders are worth twenty thousand dollars a kilo in China. So it's all you know. It's like it's like the drug trade. In fact, it's controlled by the same cartels in Mexico that uh, that are controlling the drug trade. Uh, so it's a difficult one, but um, you know. We're not afraid of the cartels. When the cartels first started getting violent, I mean, we had Molotov cocktails thrown at us and people attacking us with rocks and everything and trying to burn our ships. But uh, when that happened, uh, everybody backed out who was down there except us. And uh, so we just said, well, we're not moving. And we didn't. And so uh, we're still there. What conviction. That's that's awesome. Well, you know. People risk their, you know, I get this criticism a few times. How can you ask young people to risk their life to protect a whale or to protect a fish? I said, you know, uh, in our societies, we ask young people to not only risk their life, but to give their life for real estate and, you know, oil wells and flags and religions. So I think it's a far more noble thing to risk your life to protect an endangered species or a, or a habitat. Or the only life support system that our planet yeah. has. Yeah. Again, it comes down to this anthropocentric idea of what is valuable. I have, one of the, the best examples I've heard of, of what our values are is a few years ago, um, a ranger in Zimbabwe shot and killed a poacher who was about to kill a rhinoceros. And he was attacked by human rights groups all over the world. How dare you take a human life to protect an animal? And I think his answer really revealed the hypocrisy and the contradictions in our society when he said, if I was a police officer in Harare and a man ran out of the bank, uh, the Barclays Bank with a bag of money, and I shot him in the head and killed him right in front of everybody, you'd call me a hero and put a medal on me. How is it that a bag of paper is worth more than the future heritage of Zimbabwe? Yeah, that's an excellent answer. So... It was kind of funny to me hearing about you saying, like, we have had Molotov cocktails thrown at us. And you were kind of laughing a little bit about, like, saying, like, we've had all we've had all of this stuff. Have you ever been afraid in any of these positions you've been in? Or do you just kind of roll with the punches and say, you know, this is what we're here doing? <laughs> well, I've been doing it for half a century. And uh, <laughs> so it's it's no, I'm not really afraid. It's or it's almost become routine, really. <laughs> It's amazing what, what a human can get used to when it's well, what they experience. You can't live forever. <laughs> and to go out doing something as noble as, as Everybody said I was going to get myself killed by the time I was 30. I'm now 72. So you are <laughs> you are well past what people had predicted, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I had some close calls, but uh, what I, again, I'm most proud of the fact none of our people have ever been injured, let alone killed. Which is pretty impressive for the types of you know nuts and bolts elbow grease action that you guys are doing you know you're not afraid of direct action you're you're out there i mean i saw footage last night while we were preparing for this interview of, of boats running into each other and and you know trying to to stop whaling action so it's it's pretty incredible that uh there has been no loss of life no no injuries that have occurred in your work that's, oh, it that's takes a lot of precautions yeah mm -hmm. and also my crew are amateurs and uh Somebody said, you know, you got all these people who are amateurs, they're not professionals. I said, I don't want professionals. Professionals, professionals can get you killed. Uh, professionals, uh, you know, they don't have the passion that is needed. I couldn't pay people to do what these people do for nothing. 
Right. You know? And because of that, because they're amateurs, they, they, they don't go in with so much competence they're going to get themselves hurt. You know, they, they take the precautions. They listen to uh, your concerns and your warnings. Yeah, that's, so I'm a scuba instructor. I have been for a while now. And, and as I was getting trained and, and going from being a, a recreational scuba diver to a professional scuba diver, uh, my instructor trainer sat me down and said, look, the most people who die from scuba diving accidents are instructors because mm-hmm. they have they feel like they have this confidence and they know everything about it and it is just as dangerous as your first dive. Yeah. So so you have to be cautious about it and, and retain that willingness to listen to the concerns that are being presented to yes, you. Just like this parachutist who had over a thousand jumps and he one day jumped out of the airplane without his parachute because he was so used to it having it. He just didn't even think that he didn't have it on. Right. <laughs> so I... I'd like to ask how you started involving media, mass media coverage mm. of your work, um, because you've been doing this since the 70s, since 77. and Earlier, we- actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I uh, majored in communications. Oh, and really? one, of the, uh, one of our visiting professors from the University of Toronto was Marshall McLuhan. I don't know if you've heard of him. But Marshall McLuhan wrote the book, The Medium is a Massage and the Gutenberg Galaxy. He was the guru of the media. In fact, he's a household word in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, he gave me an understanding of what the media is. And one of the things he said is the medium is the message. That is, it's more important than the message it conveys. When we put Seaspiracy on Netflix, the reason it was so effective was it was on Netflix. <laughs> see? Right. You right. could put any a documentary out there, but if nobody's going to see it, what's what's the point? So it's how you get it across. But there's also four elements of, uh, of media, which I call sex, scandal, violence, and celebrity. Every story has one of those elements, or if they have all four, they have a super story you can't get rid of. <laughs> and, you know, for instance, in 1977, when I took Bridget Bardot to the ice flows off in of Newfoundland, that guaranteed us the cover of every major magazine in the world. And we got more, we got more across to people because of that. That. So that's why, you know, I sent Pamela Anderson to the to to Russia in order to meet with uh, with Putin, for example. You know, he, she he sat down and listened to her. Not right. gonna listen Love to me, me. right? <laughs> and that, and uh, you know, a, a good a good example is back in '84, I led a campaign to protect wolves in northern British Columbia, and uh, uh, we had the perfect story: the violence of them shooting wolves, the threats to kill us if we intervened, an environment minister that we caught taking a bribe from a big game hunting organization, violence and scandal. How can we round this up? I recruited Bo Derek as our spokesperson for this. And uh, at the press conference, one of the reporters said, oh, come on now. What does Bo Derek know about wolves? This is stupid. And I said, well, if I had the best wolf biologist in the world here, it'd be an empty room. But I see the place is packed and it's going to be the front page story of your newspaper tomorrow, isn't it? And there's not a damn thing you can do about it, is there? And that's where it was. You know, you just have to manipulate the thing. So that I always sort of joke is because on our advisory board of celebrities, we have Pierce Brosnan, we had Sean Connery, we have, uh, you know, we have Richard Dean Anderson, we have Martin Sheen, we have Christian Bale. And so I would say, how, how can we lose? We got Batman, we got, we got <laughs> Captain Kirk, twice. we got James Bond, <laughs> you know, we got, uh, we got MacGyver, we, you know, we, we can't right. lose. And that's one of the reasons, and as Martin Sheen said, you know, he does a lot of things for us and everything. He says, I don't really know anything, but people think I know everything. And, and you know, they're using that position yeah. to affect positive change in the world. Yeah, a lot of people in this country actually think Martin Sheen was the president of the United States, which is really weird. <laughs> that's bizarre, yeah. He told me when he played Robert E. Lee in Gettysburg that uh, he was really actually blown away by the fact that a lot of those reenactors... Mm-hmm thought he was Robert Lee, Robert E. Lee. They were coming for photographs and signatures. They wanted him to sign Robert E. Lee. He didn't want to sign Martin Sheen. Right. <laughs> That's, that is bizarre. Well, yeah, because people, we, a lot of people live in fantasy worlds. Right. You know? I mean, our whole society is based on illusions and delusions and fairy tales and, and escapes stories. from reality. Yeah. All major religions in the world are anthropocentric. All, every single one of them, major ones, I'm not talking about indigenous ones, but major ones, they're all saying, we're number one. It's all about us. It's all created about for us. And that, I think, is, you know, is a form of collective mass psychosis, you know, in a way. And uh, there are only, I think our only salvation to live in a world that can be protected is to return to the biocentric point of view, to understand our relationship with all other species and learn to live in harmony with them. It's a matter of humbling ourselves to be aware of our true place in the world. Well, you know, we tend to brag about we're the most intelligent species on the planet, but we're not. 
uh, you know, I was doing a debate with a Norwegian whaler. And he says, well, Watson, you say whales are more intelligent than people. How, how can you say something so stupid? I said, well, George, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with the natural world. And by that criteria, whales are far more intelligent than we are. And he said, well, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. I said, George, you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Absolutely. I, that's a great way to measure it. And I think when you measure it that way, you're 100% right. Well, you know, our intelligence, we define what is intelligence, eye to hand coordination. If a blob of protoplasm stepped out of a, stepped out of a spaceship with a ray gun, oh, must be intelligent. You know, right. that's right. how we measure the intelligence. Right. But th take a look, for instance, the human brain is 1,700 cubic centimeters. The orca brain is 6,000 cubic centimeters. Sperm whale brain, the largest brain to ever evolved on the planet, is a 9,000 cubic centimeter brain. Their brains are far more uh, complex, more convolutions on the neocortex area. And cetaceans have four lobes of the brain where we have three. Highly intelligent, but they don't have hands. They don't need cars. They don't need telephones. In fact, whales can communicate over hundreds of miles underwater. Uh, they don't have to wear clothes. They, so they're, they're perfectly adapted to the environment that they live in. We've understood now that dolphins actually use have names for each other. You know, yeah, they can, uh, call signs for each other. And that, so they, their, their ability to communicate far surpasses what we are. And we're just learning so much about the intelligence. Now we're finding out that mushrooms communicate, trees communicate using fungal systems and everything. Life is far, far more complex than we actually understand that it is. If you were to go back and speak to yourself at the beginning of your own journey today with all of the information, all of the experiences you've had, what bit of advice do you wish you had heard at the start of this that could have brought you online faster or increased the impact of your work? I think I would probably be more aggressive in certain situations, which, uh, you know, because you have to measure your response and, you know, operating within the boundaries of practicality and the law. But in when hindsight, I would probably have gone much further and be more aggressive in certain situations. So in the time you've been doing this, what was your most memorable voyage? There's hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> you should see the smile that just came across his face. I, I, I really couldn't uh, <laughs> say, uh, you know, I spent a total of 36 months sailing in the Southern Ocean. And I would say that that would probably be where what I enjoyed most. This is probably the most beautiful place in the world, in the, in the coast of Antarctica. And, Antar and, and, you know, the animals aren't afraid of you. And uh, it's just absolutely pristine. You know, very few people down there. <laughs> And uh, so I think that my time spent down there is, uh, you know, I've actually led more campaigns to Antarctica than Amundsen, Scott, and Shackleton together. Wow. Know, and that. But of course, uh, no, it's not the same kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. That. But um, so if I ha if, if there's any campaign that I would love to do again, would be there, but there's not, uh, there's no reason for it. We, we won, so there's no reason to go and do it. Good. But uh, <laughs> that's where I would probably like, like to go. Awesome. If somebody listening wanted to learn more about you and your organization, where could we direct them? Uh, well, we have numerous uh, websites, seashepherd.org. Um, and then every country has seashepherd.australia, whatever. <laughs> AU, I guess that would be, or UK. <laughs> and that. And uh, we also have, um, you know, we're on Facebook, of course, just put Sea Shepherd on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Pretty easy to find. Well, if you're listening right now and you guys would like to uh, click on the link, scroll down to the show notes. We've got that link right there. You guys can go straight from listening to this podcast to learning more about this incredibly influential organization. Paul, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. We've really enjoyed this episode. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.